Uh, it is my honor to be able to introduce you to our speaker uh, this evening. Rob Boston is uh, a senior policy analyst and assistant director of communications for Americans United for the Separation of Church and State. He also serves as assistant editor of AU's monthly magazine, uh, Church and State, and we have free copies back here on the table as well. Uh, Mr. Boston joined America's United staff in 1987, frequently writes about political goals of the religious right and other church and state issues, such as religion in public schools, uh, tax aid to sectarian education, and religious freedom. He covers the U.S. Supreme Court for church and state, and he has attended oral arguments in every church and state case um, at the Supreme Court since 1988. Um, yeah. Uh, Boston is the author of three books. All three books are published by Prometheus Books. Uh, Close Encounters with the Religious Right, Journeys into the Twilight Zone of Religion and Politics, published in 2000. The Most Dangerous Man in America, Pat Robertson and the Rise of the Christian Coalition, uh, 1996. And Why the Religious Right is Wrong about the Separation of Church and State, second edition was 2003. In addition, Boston serves as a spokesman for Americans United and has appeared on NBC's Nightly News, uh, CNN uh, with Anderson Cooper, Fox News Channel's The O'Reilly Factor, and <laughs> I was going to let that go over a moment. Ago. Uh, and then uh, Countdown with Keith Oberman um, and other programs. He also appears um, on guest as a guest speaker on talk radio programs um, all over the country, and has been interviewed by numerous print media outlets. And of course. Uh, he represents America's United at speaking engagements around the country. Uh, awesome. Last time we're going to move this thing, I promise. <laughs> okay. Everybody hear me? Sound good? Yes. Great. Thank you so much for coming out. I mean that sincerely. I know that there are other things you could be doing on a Friday night, and I really appreciate that you filled this room to hear what I have to say. I'm honored by your presence. And it's really a pleasure for me to be here. I, this is my second trip to Wichita, actually. I was here in July of 2000. It was 105 degrees. <laughs> we were discussing evolution and creationism, which some of you might remember was uh, just a little bit of a problem in this state in the year 2000. <laughs> Gave two speeches in Kansas, one over by Kansas City, and then I came over here to Wichita, spoke, and there were other speakers uh, speaking in other parts of the state about that event, trying to explain to the people of Kansas why they might want to consider teaching evolution in the public school system. <laughs> and as you know, residents of the state, things have been kind of going back and forth on that over the years. But tonight I'm here to talk to you, I know you face a lot of challenges. I know you face challenges for faith-based initiatives and a governor who's not very favorable to the idea of separation of church and state and a legislature that oftentimes is not supportive of that concept. So I understand all of those challenges that you're facing. In the National Office of Americans United, wants to help you as much as we can with all these issues. And we want you to help yourself too. So if you're not a member of Americans United locally, I would urge you to please do that tonight. It's possible for you to sign up. You'll get uh, Church and State Magazine. There's literature here. Please help yourselves with that. I'll talk to my book in the back. And of course, I'll take questions later. But tonight, I, I, I'm talking a little bit about something that kind of ties a lot of these issues together. And that is the idea, the assertion often made by the religious right. That, that the United States is a Christian nation. It was founded to be a Christian nation. And my talk really is the, the Christian nation myth. Because I want to debunk that, but I want to do more than that. I want to talk about why it's wrong historically, why it's wrong culturally, but I also want to talk a little bit about why it has such staying power. Why so many people believe it. Why so many people have invested so much energy in promoting the idea. Because to really respond to it, we need to understand a little bit more of why it has such seductive power for so many people. And I think once we understand that a little bit better, we're really able to respond to so many of these issues that you are struggling with here in Kansas, and that people are struggling with all around the country. So in a sense, this is really kind of the, the big idea behind separation of church and state. And I'm not a lawyer. I just play one on TV. <laughs> but I'm going to set my argument up tonight in a way that an attorney might present it in court by looking at certain lines of evidence. And I'll present these to you one by one, then we'll kind of move into the sort of psychological factors as to why people support this idea, wrap up, and uh, that'll be that. But let me begin by 
I'm saying the obvious point, the first point, most obvious point, is what does our Constitution say? I mean, really, we shouldn't need to go beyond this point. But it would be a pretty short speech if we stopped here. <laughs> does it say we're a Christian nation? No, it does not. Now, there are a lot of people who think it does. It always amazes me. I mean, the Constitution of the United States, I hear it's on the internet. Now, you can find this thing, you can read it, you can see what it says. Admittedly, it's not exactly reading to the beach. You know, it's got some language in there, it's realistic, it's formula, it's a little difficult. But if you get through it, and you read the amendments, you will see that there are just uh, three references to religion. The first being, of course, the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Those are the religion clauses. That doesn't say we're a Christian nation. In fact, it seems to kind of cut the other way. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. They're not going to set up an official religion, have an official religion, promote religion, aid religion. And 14th Amendment, applying the Bill of Rights or applying to the states. So it's more than just Congress now. State governments also are not allowed to do that. The second reference to religion in the uh, Constitution is found in Article 6. Article 6 is a lengthy article, deals with a lot of things. But at the end, it has this interesting language that says that there shall be no religious test for public office in the United States. Now, how did that get there? Why is it in there? Why at the end of this rather legalistic article do you suddenly have this language about no religious tests for federal laws? Well, because there had been such things in some states. And they had created a situation where people were being denied the right to hold public office based on what they believed or did not believe about God or Christianity or religion. And it was a delegate from South Carolina named Charles Pinckney. And Pinckney was very much a proponent of the idea that nobody should be denied the right to hold public office because of what they believed or did not believe about religion. So he worked very hard and he put this into the Constitution. Now, there were people who didn't like this. There were people who fought against this idea. There were people who thought that we couldn't really establish a government without some type of religious qualification, religious requirement. And they had their say. There was a gentleman from uh, Maryland named Luther Martin. He was giving a report on the adoption of the Constitution to fellow lawmakers. And he said, with no small amount of sarcasm, there were some members so unfashionable as to think that the belief in the existence of a deity and of a state of future rewards and punishments would be some security for the good conduct of our rulers. So he was an advocate for the idea that, well, yeah, maybe there should be some type of religious qualification for office. But it did not carry the day. The opposite was so. So that's the second reference to religion. Again, one that is protective of religious freedom broadly and does not give special protections to Christianity. The third reference is an incidental use of the phrase, in the year of our Lord, when the document was signed. And nobody's really sure how this got into the document. Nobody's really sure who put it there. But it is a rather uh, minor thing. Sometimes you'll see religious right advocates seize onto that and say, aha, they signed it in the year of our Lord. So it must mean we're a Christian nation. Well, to my way of thinking, if the founders had wanted us to be an officially Christian nation, they would have stated that up front in the document, in the body of the document, not in the place where they signed it at the end. Uh, they were quite capable of being very specific when they needed to be. You know, if you want to run for president, you have to be a certain age, and that age is spelled out in the document, in the Constitution. Uh, there are other things that are very specific. So I, I don't think that uh, an argument that we can somehow infer that we're a Christian nation, even though the document doesn't say that, is going to hold water. So that's, that's the first. And that really, I think, is the most powerful one out there. When people say, and I hear it a lot, you know, we were founded to be a Christian nation, my first response is, where does it say that in a governing document, in the U.S. Constitution? Don't point to other documents, which they like to do. You know, they'll point to the deistic reference to the, uh, to the Creator in uh, the Declaration of Independence. They will point to documents that were published after the Constitution, like the Northwest Ordinance. They'll point to these, because some of them have references to religion in them. But those are not governance documents. If you have trouble with the law, you don't get to cite your rights under the Northwest Ordinance. <laughs> you cite your rights under the Constitution. So I'm not really interested in what other documents say. I'm interested in what the governing document of the nation say. It does not say we're a Christian nation. That's argument one. Argument two. What were the political beliefs of the individuals who wrote the document, the Constitution? Did they ever express interest or support for the idea 
that we would be legally or officially a Christian nation. Did they write that? Did they say that? Did they advocate for that? Well, no, actually, they said pretty much the opposite. You have to remember, the founders came out of a European experience where, in many cases, church and state were combined, were joined together. Certainly in, in England, where many of the founders could trace their roots, still has an established church even to this day. And many of the other European powers had, if not an established church, some type of official relationship with religion, whether it's supported through taxes, what have you. They also were forged by their experience in the colonies. Many of the colonies, as many of you probably know, did have official churches or some type of relationship with the church that they had uh, enshrined as the uh, favorite church, the uh, established church, favorite one. And many of you may be familiar with uh, the experience of Virginia, where Thomas Jefferson and James Madison worked together to disestablish the Anglican Church in Virginia. And in many ways, this was kind of a run-up to the First Amendment, the Bill of Rights. Uh, and this was something that uh, Jefferson and Madison were doing together. Jefferson trying to get it through, unable to do so. Many years later, Madison picked it up, pushed the, land, pushed the legislation through while Jefferson was in France, representing our interests there. So Madison, pushing through this bill that did two things, ended the state-established religion of Virginia and guaranteed everybody the right to have their own religious freedom to belong to a church or not belong to a church as dictated by conscience. Now, when this was proposed in the Virginia legislature, there were people, again, who stood up and did not agree with this idea. And they said, and they argued, this right should only be extended to Christians. That is to say, you should have the right to belong to any church you want as long as it is a Christian church. But that did not carry the day. That amendment was defeated. And when James Madison wrote to Thomas Jefferson in France to tell him about that, that incident, Jefferson was very pleased. He was happy that that amendment had been defeated. And he wrote that the insertion was rejected by a great majority in proof that they meant to comprehend within the mantle of its protection the Jew and the Gentile, the Christian and the Mohammedan, the Hindu, the infidel of every denomination. See, you've got to love God and Jefferson. Even the infidels are going to get along. They're going to get their day under Jefferson. That's the Virginia experience, the passage of the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom. Madison's famous memorial and remonstrance against religious assessments. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail there. My point is that the political beliefs of the key founders very much went in the direction of no official church, no official religion, no relationship where church and state are mutually dependent on one another because they had seen the problems this created in Europe, they had seen the problems they created in the colonies. They didn't do it because they didn't like religion or they felt religion was a bad idea or an evil force. They did it because they knew that when church and state were combined, people's rights were denied. Remember, it hadn't been that long before at the time of Jefferson and Madison that we saw things like Quakers being hanged on the Boston Common, Roger Williams being driven out of the Bay Colony and, have, and going off and founding a city he called Providence because his religious opinions conflicted with those of the local government in Boston. So all of these sort of things led many of the key founders to argue very strongly for the separation of church and state, the idea that there will be no official religion. <coughs> Alexander Hamilton talked about this a little bit in one of the Federalist Papers. Uh, remember, the Federalist Papers were written to encourage people to rally around the idea of a constitution and a government established the way that uh, the founders wanted it to be established. And at one point, Hamilton was writing about the difference between the US president and the English king. Because people didn't understand what, 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 what was this president? What was he going to do? What kind of duties would he have? There hadn't been him all before. So people were thinking, is this going to be like a king? And Hamilton, one of his arguments was, well, you know, one of the key differences is that the king over in England, he has spiritual duties. But our president will have no spiritual duties. Now, over the years, a lot of presidents have forgotten that they don't have any spiritual duties. <laughs> and a lot of governors have forgotten that they don't have any spiritual duties. There's a certain governor, I won't name, I won't name him, but he went to a big rally in Texas <laughs> with the governor there. But they thought they had spiritual duties, but they don't have spiritual duties officially. So there is the argument that the, the founders very strongly having this idea. And interestingly enough, there were a number of ministers who were strongly supportive of this idea that we would separate church and state. So they were on board with this. Now, there certainly were clergy who were strongly in the other direction. 
But there were advocates of this idea. One of them was a very um, uh, interesting gentleman named John Leland. I want to talk just a second about him because he's so fascinating. He was a Baptist. And this is back in the day when the Baptist, real strong in separation of church and state. I mean, there's still some like that today. But unfortunately, a lot of Southern Baptists have come and gone the other direction now. And they're, they're kind of in the other way. But this guy was a real strong church and separation, hellfire Baptist, speaking the now, giving the word. And he wrote a number of sermons, and he talked about it from the pulpit. Uh, and one of the things that he did, interestingly enough, was he helped create an end to establish churches in three colonies. He helped in Virginia when Jefferson and Madison were working on it. Then he went back home to where he was from, Massachusetts. He did it there. And while living in Massachusetts, he would do cross-border raids into Connecticut and help them end the established church there. John Lennon once said, this is one of my favorite quotes by Haynes, the notion of a Christian commonwealth should be exploded forever. Not a real subtle guy. <laughs> So that's argument two. Political beliefs of the founders. Did they advocate for separation of church and state or did they advocate for a Christian nation? They did not advocate for a Christian nation. They advocated for separation. Third line of argument. What were the religious beliefs of these people? Were the theological beliefs such that they would lead them to embrace a relationship between church and state? Or did their theology take them in another direction? A direction that enshrined freedom of conscience the right to make your own decisions, the right to make your own opinions about these matters. And I have to stress to you how sometimes radical that idea of having your own right of conscience was at this time. As I said a moment ago, we're coming off of a period where, you know, just maybe 100 years before, people were still being executed or imprisoned because of their religious beliefs, and not even that long before. As a young man, James Madison observed Baptist preachers sitting in jail in Orange County, Virginia, because they preached a doctrine on the street that conflicted with the Anglican Church. They were put in prison for that. And Madison wrote to a friend in Philadelphia, he was very mad about it. He said he wanted to breathe the free air of Pennsylvania because Pennsylvania had more freedom in religious matters. So even within their own lifetimes, the founders had experienced or seen these types of persecutions. What well, did that inform their religious beliefs? Did it affect their theology? Well, probably. When we look at the founders, we look at the key founders and what they believe, let me just run down a couple here, because uh, I think there's a lot of mythology about the founding fathers and what they believe. And if you, if you hear some of today's TV preachers talk, men like Thomas Jefferson and James Madison and George Washington, well, they were just like Jerry Falwell and Powder Quigs. <laughs> but it wasn't like that at all, believe me. George Washington is an interesting character, for example. Uh, a lot of founders were influenced by a religious system that you don't really hear a lot about today, but was more common back then. It was deism. And deism was an idea of a, of a god that sort of put the universe into motion and was involved with things, but then sort of stepped back a little bit from creation. It was kind of letting things wind down. The deist would use the metaphor of a watch. If you, if you wind up a pocket watch, put it on a shelf, the watch winds down. If you don't wind it up again, it'll stop. So the deist god wasn't necessarily one that you would appeal to a lot with prayer and other types of supplications. But the deist god existed and, and certainly had a role to play. But they would use unusual terms. George Washington, for example, would speak about the supreme architect of the universe. Kind of an unusual term today, on today's ears. But very common back then. Washington believed in a kind of what I would call a social utilitarian view of religion. The idea that Religion was important, it was necessary because it helped ensure good behavior, but you didn't really want to get into a lot of other forms of religion that lended to lead people off into more extreme avenues. Uh, interesting story about Jefferson, for some reason, while he attended services pretty regularly, he would always leave before communion was issued. It was like he had something, had a problem with that. So it's an indication that, at least when it comes to some of the core Christian doctrines, Washington might have been a little bit uh, wary of those, or, or not necessarily important. The second is John Adams, uh, second president of the United States. John Adams kind of became, you know, much more popular a few years ago, and that bio biography came out about him. It was a TV miniseries, and all of a sudden everybody was talking about John Adams, you know. Uh, but before then, nobody had really paid much attention to John Adams. And I don't know how much information about John Adams' religious views came out during any of that, that stuff, because they're interesting. Uh, John Adams, very much again in a deistic mode. John Adams did not believe, for example, in the divinity of Jesus. There's a story where John Adams wrote about in his diary. He had a visitor come to his house, a man he identified as Major Green. Major Green, obviously he's a kind of army officer, came to the house 
and they fell into a discussion about religion and Christianity. Major Green was a very devout man, and a Christian, and he argued with uh, John Adams about the divinity of Christ. And John Adams challenged Major Green. Well, how do you know this is true? And Major Green said that, well, our mere minds cannot grasp these mysteries. John Adams wrote, the mystery is made a convenient cover for absurdity. <laughs> Next is uh, Thomas Jefferson. And it's really hard to tell where to begin when you're talking about Thomas Jefferson. Uh, obviously one of the strongest advocates for separation of church and state uh, that we know of for the founding period. Uh, very learned man, a man who had an enormous library that he had gathered up over the years that he later sold to became the basis of the Library of Congress. Probably one of the most, perhaps the most intelligent individual ever to occupy the White House. A flawed man in some ways, obviously, as our founders were. We can't, you know, turn them into demigods. They had their, their flaws. A slave owner, uh, a man who could not see past some of the prejudices of his day. But nevertheless, when it came to separation of church and state, a very powerful advocate, and, and when it comes to religion, views that would today make it impossible for him to be elected to public office anywhere, virtually anywhere in the country. Let me read to you one thing that Thomas Jefferson wrote, in a letter to John Adams, by the way. Jefferson and Adams had this great correspondence and went back and forth when they were retired from public life. And even though the mail system wasn't as efficient as it is today, they managed to generate a huge volume of letters over many years. And they often talked about religion. Here's what Jefferson wrote. The day will come when the mystical generation of Jesus by the Supreme Being, as his father in the womb of a virgin, will be classed with the fable of the generation of Minerva in the brain of Jupiter. <laughs> Can you imagine anybody, I mean, a politician, a political leader, writing something like that today, comparing the virgin birth to the generation of the brain of, of Jupiter? I mean, it, it, it's, it's an amazing thing. Also, it was a letter that Jefferson wrote to a friend named William Short on uh, October 31st, 1819. Again, I'm talking about religion. Jefferson's in retirement, so he can be a lot more uh, open about what he believes. <laughs> Jefferson decided to, basically this guy wrote to Jefferson and asked him, what do you believe? But Jefferson decided to answer it by listing the things he did not believe. Here's what he did not believe. The immaculate conception of Jesus, his deification, the creation of the world by him, his miraculous powers, his resurrection, invisible ascension, his corporeal presence in the Eucharist, the Trinity, original sin, atonement, regeneration, election, <laughs> orders of hierarchy, etc. Okay, the etc. is really fascinates me. <laughs> What's left? What's left? <laughs> now, I mean, I, you know, and, and certainly there are Christians who would disagree very strongly with Thomas Jefferson. More power to them. Okay, let them hash it out. Yeah. My point is that, that, that Jefferson was absolutely right about any of this. It's that he had this view, and that this was not a view of a man who would establish a Christian nation, <laughs> because that's not what he believed. The fourth. Uh, founder, one of the most important, uh, is Madison, James Madison. And Madison, in, in some ways, is actually the most important of the batch. I mean, he doesn't get the kind of press that Jefferson got. You know, Jefferson's this very, um, cuts a very romantic figure through history. He's six feet four, he's got this red hair, he's this fascinating intellect, women love him. You know, he's just, just this really rock star kind of guy. And then you got James Madison, he's five foot one, weighs about 100 pounds. <laughs> He writes really well. <laughs> I can relate. <laughs> Madison did a little thing called writing the Constitution. Helped write the Bill of Rights. A very, very important figure. And when it comes to religion on Madison, well, we just don't know a whole lot. As a young man, he had a very strong interest in, in, in religion. He considered becoming a clergyman himself. Then it just kind of faded away. And he never really talked about it. Unlike Jefferson, who had this voluminous correspondence with so many people about religion and talked about it, Madison never really did. But we do know one thing about Madison. He hated the idea of church and state being combined. He once called that a loathsome combination. As president, James Madison vetoed a bill that had been passed by the Congress that would have given a symbolic charter to an Episcopal church in Washington, D.C., and charged them with the task of caring for the poor it was kind of an early faith-based initiative. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't even that. It didn't give them any money. It just gave them a piece of paper, a charter, and said, eh, go care for some poor people. He vetoed that. And in his message, he said, this violates the First Amendment. We can't have laws respecting an establishment of religion. So even that went too far for James Madison. 
Again, not the kind of guy who is going to advocate for a union of church and state. The final point to make here is this. You will hear people argue that the founding fathers were of a fundamentalist mindset sometimes. Now, there are TV preachers and pseudo-historians who make this claim. But the idea of fundamentalism, as we understand it today, is a fairly recent phenomenon. It traces its origins back to a series of pamphlets that were written between 1910 and 1915 called, not surprisingly, The Fundamentals. <laughs> so the idea of fundamentalism would have been just completely anachronism to the founders. I mean, there they were certainly conservative forms of Christianity, but fundamentalism as we know it today, not something they would have dealt with. The fourth point. How did conservative Christians react to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights at that time when those documents were adopted or shortly thereafter? And that's where things really get interesting because what you find when you do research in this area is you find conservative ministers attacking the Constitution and attacking the Bill of Rights. Why did they attack it? Because it did not specifically state that we were a Christian nation. There was a minister, his name was John Mason, he was a pastor of a New York church. He gave a famous sermon in 1793. So this is just a couple of years after the adoption of the Bill of Rights. He's saying, the omission of God and the Constitution is an omission which no pretext whatever can palliate. It will overturn us from the foundations of the fabric we have been rearing and crush us to atoms in a wreck. Crush us to atoms. It's like, like Pat Robertson in his day, you know? Pat Roberts is always sending a hurricane up to smote his enemies and things like that. Maybe a meteor if he can summon one up. Here's this guy kind of saying, well, we didn't recognize Christianity or Jesus or God in our Constitution, and he is going to wreck us. He's going to bring divine punishment upon us. And he wasn't the only one saying that. 1811, Reverend Samuel Austin gives a famous speech to his congregation in which he writes, our Constitution is entirely disconnected from Christianity. This is a capital defect which will inevitably lead to its destruction. Now, if we had been a Christian nation, if that had been the intent of the founders, if that had been stated bluntly, these ministers would not have been giving sermons like this. They looked at that as a fault. Now, this continued well into the 19th century. In fact, we got to the point, around the time of the Civil War, Abandoned ministers became convinced that because we had not officially declared ourselves a Christian nation, that God was punishing us with a civil war. Remember what these ministers were saying back in the early period. God was going to bring vengeance upon us because we had not declared ourselves officially Christian. That punishment, according to these ministers, was the civil war. They formed an organization, they formed a lobbying group called the National Reform Association. The National Reform Association had a couple of goals. One was to get some type of recognition of God on our money. Another was passage of some kind of a national bill to mandate Sunday be a day of rest. And the third, most interestingly, was rewrite the preamble to the Constitution to explicitly recognize Jesus Christ and Christianity. Let me read to you. Have it. I don't think I do. But essentially, they had this new preamble that recognized Jesus Christ, Christianity, and God. And they put this up for a vote in the Congress several times. It never really got, obviously, passed because it's not part of our Constitution today. But my point is, if we had already been a Christian nation, they would not have been advocating for this at the time of the Civil War and shortly thereafter. A couple other things that happened around this time. Uh, and God we trust. I mentioned a moment ago, one of their goals was to get some type of recognition of God on currency. That again is a post-Civil War or a Civil War manifestation of what scholars now call civil religion. There was a minister in Pennsylvania, and he was one of these ministers who was convinced God was punishing us because we had not recognized him or Christianity in the Constitution. So he wrote to the Secretary of the Treasury and he suggested that the phrase, God is our trust, be put on the coins. Coins back then were the main form of currency. Well, the Secretary of the Treasury liked the idea, so he tinkered with it a little bit, changed it to In God We Trust, and they started putting it on coins. So there you go. That dates from the time of the Civil War. Now, there are people on the religious right today who are convinced that, you know, 
George Washington sat down personally and he designed the first penny <laughs> with Abraham Lincoln's picture on it. <laughs> and he put in God we trust on that, right? That, that started at the time of the Civil War. It was not codified for use on paper currency until 1956. So, a fairly recent thing. About the same time they slipped under God in the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, the attempt to rewrite the preamble was proposed in 1864 voted on in 1874, reintroduced in 1882, reintroduced, this is shocking, in 1961, 1963, and 1965. So as recently as the early 60s, this thing was still being introduced. Interestingly enough, when it was introduced in 1874, the House Judiciary Committee actually voted on it, just as far as it ever went. They voted it down. They said, we are taking this step in full realization of the dangers which the union between church and state had imposed in so many nations on the, in the old world. So even at that time, you know, that post-Civil War period, people were reaching back to the argument that inspired Jefferson and Madison. Okay, point five. If all this stuff was happening in the late 19th century, Civil War, post-Civil War, doesn't that tell us something about the origin of this myth? Yes, it does. It tells us that the real origin of the Christian nation myth is from that period. It's not from the founding period. It's not something that James Madison came up with. It's not something that Thomas Jefferson came up with. It's from this antebellum period. Civil War, post-Civil War. Why did it happen then? Well, scholars who have looked at this have argued that the post-Civil War was a very traumatic period for the country, obviously. Reconstruction, attempts to bring these states that had been in rebellion back into the nation. There was still a lot of resistance to this. Uh, people were unsure how to proceed. The president had been assassinated. His successor was a weak man, did not have a coherent vision for how to reunify the nation. When that happens, when you have that type of chaos, people are left grasping for answers. When people are left grasping for answers, some certain number of them will gravitate to religion and will demand that there be more religious expression in government and in public life. We have seen examples of that in our times as well. And that is really what brought this about. So the National Reform Association, seeing this chaos, this confusion, this wounded nation, took advantage of it to press its agenda. I mentioned the Christian Nation Amendment, the Sunday Laws. They also advocated for a generic form of Protestantism in the public school system, such as it was back then. It wasn't very extensive. But they were successful with that as well. Many of the schools would open their day with recitations of the Lord's Prayer or readings from the King James Version of the Bible, which of course is the Protestant version. So you had that. Also, they advocated for a broad program of censorship of anything that they saw as offensive to the scriptures. In the 1880s, uh, a gentleman uh, who lived in San Francisco came to New York City and attempted to stage a uh, dr dr dramatized version of the Passion of Christ uh, on Broadway. And that he was shut down. New York, New York City Council passed laws banning this because it was considered blasphemous and scandalous to present the life of Christ on the stage. Ministers had the power to do this sort of thing. And we see echoes of that into the modern era as well. So that's the story from the late 19th century. That's really the origin of the myth. That's really where it comes from. When people are advocating for this idea, the Christian nation, we were founded to be a Christian nation, what they're really reaching back to is not the founding period, but a period post-Civil War which is probably the closest we ever came to officially or semi-officially or unofficially be a Christian nation. Many of the laws at that time did in fact reflect a sort of de facto version of generalized Protestantism. Some of the things they tried to do went too far, but many of the laws did, and it took a while for those to fade away or to be overturned by courts in more recent times. Where does that leave us? Well, the hold of the myth today. Why does something that some ministers conjured up post-Civil War still resonate with so many people today? Why do so many people believe it? Why do so many people, when shown the plain text of the Constitution, stay and still argue, well, it, yeah, but we're still a Christian nation? Why are they oblivious to facts? Well, this is where we kind of get into the realm of, of, of psychology, perhaps, a little bit. And there are a number of reasons, I think, why this is so. Number one would be there, there's a myth of or a desire of national goodness that every nation wants. And we really perfected that in the United States. Think about it for a minute, some of our founding myths. Manifest destiny. We were given the land by God, 
And we didn't have to respect the rights of the people that had it first. <laughs> George Washington never told a lie. <laughs> he chopped down that cherry tree, told his dad, oh, I can't tell a lie. Yes, I did it. We know these stories aren't true, but they still hold great power resonance for people because they point to what we like to believe is the fundamental goodness of our people. And it's difficult to face up to the times when we have fallen short of that standard. And for many people in this country, for a long period of time, the fundamental goodness of the people was summarized in Christianity. So naturally, if we are fundamentally good people, we must have endorsed or adopted some version of this faith. The second animating principle here is uh, the myth of the stolen legacy. This is a very powerful, motivating myth for people, many cultures, and many times, and many places. The stolen legacy myth is this, in a nutshell. There was this time when we had all this great stuff, and we were really doing well, and we were living so wonderfully, and then it was taken from us. It was stolen from us. And the religious right, and people like Noah Riley, and Glenn Beck, and some of these other folks, have, they've perfected this argument. We were doing just fine until the liberal secularists came along and took the nation. And we're going to get it back. I mean, I go to religious right meetings. I hear this stuff all the time. We are taking the nation back. It's our country. They took it from us. The Supreme Court, the secular humanists, and whoever they want to blame, whoever the enemy du jour is, they'll find a way. We're going to get it back. The third principle. Fear of social change. Very powerful, motivating factor for a lot of people. Fear of social change. Because they're afraid of the way things are shaking out, worried about changes in society, they reach back to this golden past, this mythical past that exists, that we could just get back to that period. How many times have you heard someone say, well, you know, it was just great in the 50s, but mom stayed home and dad had a salary and the children never sassed and talked back and it was Ozzie and Harriet and leave it to Beaver. Man, wasn't that great? Yeah, right. Of course, if you were a black guy living in the Jim Crow South, the 1950s weren't so great. If you were a woman who wanted to work outside the home in a profession other than teaching or secretarial work, the 1950s were not so great. If you were a Jew who wanted to stay in a hotel somewhere where they didn't allow it, well, the 1950s weren't so great. But this is a very powerful, motivating myth for a lot of people. Fear of social change. And we're seeing this today with the religious right. They are absolutely terrified about some of the changes that are occurring in the society. The ground is shifting beneath their feet and they don't know what to do. Oh my God, a same-sex couple was walking down the street and they have a baby! <laughs> I go to meetings, folks. I'm not making it up. I hear this stuff, okay? They are terrified because they cannot stop these things. They can't stop it. It's like the people that are concerned about the fact that the nation is changing demographically. These things are happening. It's a time. And they're just terrified. Terrified. So fear of social change leads people to go back to this idea of our great Christian nation. Only we could get back, if only we could convince enough people to embrace that idea, we'll get it back to the way it used to be. And we'll work out that business with those same-sex couples and their babies. <laughs> <laughs> it's that. I mean, it, it, this is the, the terrifying fear of social change. That's the fourth, uh, the third. The fourth principle is it's simply a means of political power for a lot of people. And I don't want to sound too cynical, but there are a lot of people out there who just use this myth to get themselves elected in public office, stand up, rant and rave, talk about how great it is to be stupid. <laughs> I'm not going to name any names, but there was a certain governor who gave a speech at a certain fundamentalist university the other day bragging about how bad his grades were in college. And he was pointing out that was a good thing. Faith, superior to education. And if we could just get back to that again, plain and simple means to political power for some people. The next principle, just plain and simple bigotry. Some of these people don't like Jews, they don't like Muslims, they don't like Hindus, they don't like Buddhists, they don't like atheists. Can you imagine that? So, they don't like any of these people. And when they get back to the Christian nation, well, we're going to show those people where they belong. We'll get them back in their place. So, simple bigotry. Revisionism is also a uh, very powerful motivating factor for a lot of people to get involved in religious right organizations. I talked about the politicians who manipulate that sentiment. Well, it wouldn't be there to be manipulated if somebody hadn't created it first. And that's where the religious right comes in. When I go to their meetings again, you hear all this sort of talk about how we you know, get this nation back, or it's our nation, and all this talk. The revisionist 
historical perspective is very much like creation science. They don't like the facts. They're offended by the facts. So they just come up with some new facts, or what they call facts, and they put those out there. Now I'm going to wrap up by talking a little bit about you know, why we need to oppose this. Now this may seem like a no-brainer. Well, it's wrong. That's why we need to oppose it. But it's more than that. It really is. It's wrong. It's offensive. The Christian nation myth is, it excludes people. It excludes huge numbers of people. And not just Jews and atheists and Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims. It excludes other Christians. Because when the religious right is talking about the Christian nation myth, believe me, they are not talking about the United Church of Christ. They're not talking about the liberal Christian denominations. They're not talking about an entire range of Christian thought that is valuable, important, and has motivated people to do many great things. They are talking about right-wing, Republican, fundamentalist Christianity. That's their Christian nation. So when they talk about this myth, that's what's motivating them. Not something that they're getting from a liberal Christian way. It promotes bad history. That's why we have to put up and fight it. Because we don't want our children to learn this false history. Just like I don't want my children to learn creation science, or intelligent design, or whatever they're calling it this month. I don't want them to learn this bad history. Because the real history is so much better. It's like evolution, you know? Wow, that's a really fascinating story. It's amazing, real way to think about it, to learn about it, to understand our world. Same with the real history. That we did something that no nation had ever dared to do before. We took religion and government and we just, we just separated them. We divided them. And look at how it's worked. A nation of 310 million people, thousands of faiths, a pretty good degree of interfaith harmony, more or less. Come on. You don't like that? But that's the problem. <laughs> the bad history. It downplays the importance of separation of church and state. That's the next reason we have to impose a very strong one. One of the most important principles in the world. Our America's great gift to the world. How many nations can you think of that would benefit right now if they had separation of church and state? I can think of a number, you know, a number of them. In Saudi Arabia, you can't even worship in a Christian church. And Iran and some of these other nations, and hardline Muslim nations, even places like Great Britain, you know, I think they should just get rid of that state church. They're not really doing a lot with it. Seems to me they drag these bishops out in their cool robes whenever they have a royal wedding. But really, what's the percentage of people who belong to that church now? It's something like 3%. They're being given a run for it by the Pastafarians, okay? <laughs> well, it's not joking, okay? It's bad. Because people don't want to belong to a state-kept church. So, they would do themselves a favor. And now I'm going to conclude. And I'm going to say some things here that they're important. Because we live in perilous times. And we often live in scary times. And we just came through the 10-year anniversary of 9-11. I work in DC. I, I know what people were feeling. I felt that fear myself that day. We all have been there. We have been afraid. We have been concerned. We have been worried. And we have looked for easy answers. But you must, as much as possible, if you take no other thing from this speech that I've given here tonight, remember this. Never surrender to your fear. That there are people there who want you to do that for political reasons, for their own benefit. And there are people who in the political world, in the world of public policy, media commentators, who are very much interested in getting us to embrace our fears. Because when we embrace our fears, we will trash our rights every time. History has shown this to be true. Yeah, these are difficult and challenging times. But we do not honor the memory of anybody who perished defending this nation by trashing the rights that they so fought to upheld. A very difficult thing. You know, I look at some of the things going on around this country right now, and I, I shudder. Sometimes I want to crawl into the bed. It's scary. We have people in court arguing that Muslims shouldn't have the right to build houses of worship. Really? In the United States of America? The country that pioneered religious freedom. Seriously arguing in court that Muslims by the way, peace-loving people in this case, no violence, no jihad, should not have the right to build a facility in a town in Tennessee, and the only argument they're bringing into court is, well, we don't like them. We have people arguing that they should not be able to build a facility in New York City, because it happens to be a few blocks away from ground zero. People in court saying, they got this is offensive. 
yeah, these are difficult times. But let's remember. The answer is never to give in to the fear. It is never to turn our backs on our core freedoms. Rather, the answer when we're confronted with fear or when we're confronted with political myths like the Christian nation is to grab those freedoms all the more tightly. The better that nobody can ever take them away from us. Thank you.